When I entered the room, I noticed that my wife was boiling with excitement. Impatiently, she rushed to me, showered warm kisses on my lips as a sign of sincere greeting, and then went to the kitchen to put the finishing touches on our dinner. I made your favorite tiramisu today, she said upon her return, and there was a note of anticipation in her voice. And I have some unusual news that deserves to be celebrated today. Delighted, I replied. This is amazing, my love. I have important news, too. Maybe we can have a double celebration. When the work week was finally over, it was the perfect Friday night to relax and enjoy. While Sheila was busy in the kitchen, I retired to the bedroom, intending to freshen up and change into more relaxed clothes. Since no work duties awaited me the next day, I was looking forward to a night filled with passionate intimacy with my beloved wife. Not only did I have exciting news that I was sure would arouse an unprecedented desire in her, but I was also looking forward to the news that she had to share with me. My name is Larry Dawes, and my wife is Sheila. We have been happily married for seven years now, and we are both over 30. I am 6 feet 2 inches tall and weigh 210 pounds. Overall, I am in decent physical shape. Although I am not exceptionally attractive, I have received compliments about my appearance more than once. Besides, I was said to have an above-average physique if you get my point. Sheila, by contrast, is 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighs 110 pounds. In addition, she maintains excellent physical fitness. We both go to the gym regularly. Sheila boasts long blonde hair, captivating brown eyes and an impressive torso. I guessed the news she was going to share. My wife and I decided to start a family, and a few months ago she stopped taking birth control pills. Since then, our intimate life has become, to put it mildly, quite active. Of course I must clarify that before that we were not abstinent. In the first year of our marriage, we passionately enjoyed each other's company almost every night. And believe me, it wasn't just mundane activities like assembling shelves, but over time, our passionate meetings gradually became less frequent. We got into a familiar rhythm about three times a week, more like close friends. But everything changed when Sheila stopped taking the pills. Our arguments in bed have become more frequent lately. The only times they were postponed were a few times when I had to go out of town. I didn't spend too much time in the office, usually arriving at the office by 7 a.m. and leaving work at 5 p.m. My schedule as a mechanical engineer remains relatively constant, unless I have to attend conferences or seminars, which happens about once every three months. A couple of months ago, I was promoted to the position of head of the engineering department. Accordingly, I now manage five junior engineers, three technicians, and a couple of secretaries. Besides, I was lucky enough to have my own personal secretary. Sheila, a diligent paralegal, devoted her time to working for a small local law firm. In an office consisting of five lawyers, she was one of three qualified legal assistants. It is noteworthy that her daily routine completely coincided with mine, only occasionally correcting it in connection with difficult cases that caused her to stay late at work. When I came into the kitchen, refreshed after a shower and changed my outfit, Sheila had already prepared a delicious dinner. It was obvious that she had made every effort to present her best work today. I guessed that she had taken the day off to prepare for tonight. She expertly cooked chicken scallops, a delicious Caesar salad, and delicious garlic bread. And for dessert, she made a delicious tiramisu. To complement the meal, Sheila uncorked a couple of bottles of first-class Merlot wine, intending to enjoy its exquisite taste. It was obvious that she had something to share. I was looking forward to our conversation today. Besides, I couldn't help but notice how she tried to dress up for the occasion. She looked amazing in one of her most seductive dresses with a delicate and plunging neckline. She was wearing a dress with a coquettishly short hem that emphasized her legs and hinted at the anticipation of an exciting and passionate evening. After a delicious dinner and dessert, we jointly cleared the table and put the kitchen in order. After filling our glasses with wine, we moved into the cozy living room, ready to share the good news with each other. Sitting on the couch, we leisurely sipped wine, discussing who should start. 
Her excitement was palpable, and it wasn't difficult for me to convince her to take the first step. Watching her overwhelming happiness, I couldn't help but wonder how she managed to hold it back for so long. To be honest, I expected her to share the news with me in a more unexpected way. But then she exclaimed with delight, We did it, dear! I'm pregnant! We're going to have a baby! Surprise overwhelmed me, and I joined in her glee with a loud shout. When she saw my glee, she rushed into my arms and locked her lips with mine in an intense, passionate kiss. We hugged tightly, enjoying the happiness that overwhelmed us both. In the end, she pulled away, wanting to know what news I wanted to share. My excitement almost matched hers, and I smiled broadly. I enthusiastically shared the good news with her. Josette, my secretary, is also expecting a baby. Given her single status and her desire not to raise a child alone, we came to a mutual agreement that she would entrust her baby to us for upbringing. It will be akin to the birth of twins, since both you and Josette should be born at about the same time. Although they will not have a biological connection, they will be twins in all other respects. As a father, I will not worry about custody, especially since Josette will readily transfer custody to me. She will just want to take an active part in the parental journey, like a beloved aunt for a child. Eventually we will have to discuss and clarify this difficult situation with them when they are old enough to understand and accept it. But that shouldn't be a problem for us, should it, my dear? I happily shared all this with my wife, overwhelmed with excitement. Strangely, I couldn't help but notice the obvious lack of enthusiasm on my wife's face when she heard the news. Moreover, she looked absolutely furious. I was amazed by Sheila's reaction when I shared with her the news that our family would soon increase, and I was also surprised that the increase would be twice as large. Mentally, I expected her happiness to multiply with my message. But to my amazement, her joy seemed to have completely disappeared, replaced by sharp and unexpected hostility. The fury written on her face stopped me in my tracks, forcing me to pause and keep silent about the rest of the news. Sheila, visibly upset, sank down on the sofa. I decided to share everything with her, hoping to bring her from a state of sadness to a state of joy. During the first ultrasound, Josette learned that she was expecting twins. Although it is too early to determine their gender, there is a high probability that at least one of them will be a girl. Perhaps this will be just one of them. Just imagine, my dear. You can have the precious girl you've always dreamed of, and I can have a little boy. Whichever of you has a daughter, it will be an additional source of great happiness for me. We will immediately fulfill your long-held dream of a big family. Please try not to frown and smile. I was completely perplexed by the situation. Instead of expressing joy at the news, she seemed to get even angrier. It didn't take long for it to flare up. Believe me, the power of the explosion was much greater than that of the New Year's firecracker in Hiroshima. Sheila screamed, expressing her anger. You are a vile person. You betrayed me with that disgusting woman in your office. What were you thinking? I can't believe that you really think that I would consider raising the children of someone you called a harlot. Are you crazy? From that moment on, everything went wrong. She spent the next 30 minutes shouting insults at me, using all sorts of derogatory terms. It was completely different from how I had imagined our conversation. I began to doubt whether our passionate night together would even take place. But that didn't stop me from getting my way. Darling, why don't we retire to the bedroom and celebrate our fantastic news together? I believe that through a night of intense intimacy, we will be able to understand more deeply what a wonderful journey will begin in our lives with the arrival of three precious children in our beloved family. To my amazement, she not only flatly rejected my offer, but also audaciously tried to kick me out of our bed. Well, if she doesn't want to share a dream with me anymore, let her seek solace in another sleeping place. Embarrassed by her sudden action, she hurriedly grabbed the pillows and hurried into the spare bedroom. I was puzzled, unable to understand the reason for her behavior. But feeling my innocence, I just rolled over and fell asleep peacefully for the rest of the night. 
The next morning my attempts to lure my wife into our bed for intimacy proved futile. She still harbored an illogical grudge against me, and I was completely at a loss. Noticing that she was clearly not herself, I decided to take advantage of a wonderful day and play a round of golf. The experience turned out to be absolutely exceptional, which made this day extraordinary. I had an exciting experience of intimacy. I met three good people, with a friend, his wife, and his wife's sister. It was an unforgettable time that made me realize how much more enjoyable it is than golf. In particular, I had a great connection with Keisha, my friend's sister-in-law, who, as it turned out, is not married. While I climaxed three times, she surpassed me with five. After spending three hours in passionate communication, I left her bedroom. When I got home, I was surprised to find that my garage door lock was not working. It was an unusual situation. After checking the batteries and failing to open the door, I decided to turn off the car and head for the front door. Strangely, I noticed a collection of suitcases neatly stacked on the porch. Not knowing their purpose, I ignored them and tried to open the door, but found that it was locked from the inside. Although this was not surprising, I couldn't help but wonder if Sheila had forgotten to go out and unlock it. The next morning, I decided to leave the house through the garage, considering the possibility that she hadn't taken care of the front door yet. It was strange that my key didn't fit the lock, but upon closer inspection, I realized that the lock seemed to have been recently replaced. Sheila, oddly enough, didn't say anything about needing new locks. Despite this, I was desperately trying to get into the house, feeling exhausted and sweaty. A refreshing shower and a change of clothes were urgently needed. With my usual pragmatism and caution, I took the chainsaw out of the car and began carefully cutting off the door handle and bolt to get inside. After successfully disconnecting the door handle and bolt from the door itself, it swung open without difficulty. Realizing the need for a replacement, I reminded myself to visit Lova's store to buy a new front door. Once inside, Sheila immediately launched into another tirade. Her statement that I was moving and that my clothes were already packed in suitcases on the porch seemed strange to me. I wasn't going anywhere, even in passing. Brushing aside her senseless claims, I returned to the porch, took the suitcases and carried them to the bedroom. Going through the contents of the suitcase, I noticed that all my clothes were neatly packed. It took me a few minutes to carefully sort them out, put them in drawers and hang them in cupboards. Despite her continuing tirade, I casually undressed in front of her and stepped into the shower. Her sarcastic remarks reached new heights when she caught the scent of a geisha on me, as well as lingering humidity. I couldn't understand her reaction. Was it really such a serious matter? Yes, I was with Keisha, but it was a fleeting meeting, nothing more than a one-night stand. Well, okay, maybe even more than just a one-night stand. But in the end, it was just a physical act devoid of deep meaning. I had only a limited acquaintance with this woman. When I asked Sheila to join me in the shower, she politely declined my offer. It made me think that maybe she was dealing with some kind of psychological problems that needed attention. I decided to discuss this with her and suggest seeking counseling from a psychologist later in the evening. After taking a refreshing shower and drying off, I headed to the bedroom to change my clothes. To my surprise, I found that Sheila was currently packing her things into suitcases that had recently been emptied. It was obvious that her emotions were influenced by hormonal changes occurring during pregnancy. Instead of understanding and sympathizing with her, I foolishly assumed that her erratic reactions were caused solely by hormones. This only provoked another outburst and a series of angry statements. But I did not lose hope that once she gave birth to our child, she would regain her usual composure and our relationship would stabilize again. When my twins were born, whose mother was my secretary, I had high hopes that she would become a caring mother for all three children. But Sheila's unexpected reaction left me perplexed. An hour later, she disappeared without a trace. A few days later, I decided to take Josette, the mother of my children, into my house. 
it was obvious that she needed help and emotional support. Besides, in Sheila's absence, it seemed like the right decision, especially considering that the twins are biologically mine. In addition, I should mention that from time to time I invited Keisha to my place so that she would do our common exercises, usually one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes this included making love in threesomes, where both Josette and Keisha were present. But just a week after Sheila left, I was unexpectedly handed the divorce papers. Sheila demanded ownership of the house, financial support for 18 years, 90% of our savings and investments, as well as alimony in the amount of one and a half thousand dollars per month. Simply put, she was fulfilling the terms of our marriage contract, which provided for strict punishment for infidelity. I was well aware of this situation. I admit that I had intimate relationships with both Josette and Keisha. I know that many of you who are reading this may think I am a terrible person who deserves to be punished. But three months later, my wife Sheila greeted me with anger and shock. She vented her frustration by questioning the invention I had created and calling me a heartless person. She dared to question my loyalty by using offensive language and insults. She accused me of never taking responsibility and putting the blame solely on her. Yes, the neighbors informed her about everything, and she called me an ungrateful person. This meeting was our first meeting with lawyers. We were sitting in her lawyer's office and discussing our divorce. Sheila made it clear in no uncertain terms that she was trying to make my infidelity a painful experience that needed no additional illusion. I must admit that she had the ideal means to achieve this goal, as well as a sufficient amount of evidence. Our prenuptial agreement was carefully worked out to provide for serious consequences for infidelity. Given the fact that I knocked up my secretary, and my behavior during my relationship with Keisha was not entirely impeccable, she had everything she needed to unleash her anger on me. Still, a little worry remained. I felt obligated to ask Sheila one important question. Are you sure you're going down this path? Of course, Josette will have a special place as the twin's beloved aunt, but her role is not limited to that. You must become a caring mother to all three children, understanding this responsibility. As for me, I will fulfill my duties as a loving father. In addition, we may even consider expanding our family by having one or two more children. The decision is in your hands. A simple yes or no is enough. I have outlined my proposal. But the response I received was quite insulting. She stated that she refused to raise children next to this dissolute woman. I looked at my lawyer and nodded approvingly to him, to which he reacted accordingly. Fortunately, my wife did not hire the most unfriendly person for legal representation. I was able to successfully study and analyze the most aggressive, predatory, and ferocious shark in the world. Fortunately, this achievement may have led you to think that I am an unfaithful person who betrayed his wife. I can feel you anticipating hot retribution. Get ready, because my lawyer, Lilith Shark, whose last name perfectly reflects her character, cheerfully opened her briefcase, which looked like a barracuda preparing for a hearty morning feast. Mr. Zimmerman, since your client has declined my client's kind and overly generous offer, she announced, handing the papers across the table. Let me present our revised terms. It took Sheila and her lawyer a few moments to comprehend the contents of the document, their faces flushed with embarrassment. Suddenly, Sheila burst into violent hysteria, catching both the lawyer and herself off guard. Their expressions changed from arrogant to panicked. She uttered a vulgar curse, moistened her lips, and swallowed the saliva that had gathered in her mouth. Indeed, my lawyer was the epitome of pure malice, a sinister entity seeking revenge. The lawyer's face showed panic as he turned to Sheila. With desperation in his voice, he asked about the DNA test application. Was she hiding something from him? I stood up for Sheila and admitted, Yes, we are. No, that is, yes, of course she hid it. Lilith's nod of confirmation was accompanied by the fact that she took out a tape recorder, which she placed on the table. With intrigue in her eyes, she pressed the button, betraying her curiosity. Make sure it's my baby and not your monkeys. 
the voice on the recording demanded. It belonged to Jason West, a lawyer from Sheila's place of work. Sheila's voice answered confidently, Don't worry, I always take precautions to avoid doubts during intimacy with him. Besides, you look so strikingly like my husband that he will never suspect that he is raising your child. The arrogant voice on the other end replied, Well, the main thing is that he brings up the child correctly. I hope his limited intelligence is enough to make my child a decent person. I do not intend to financially support the children or personally take care of them, but I don't mind having a child who will eventually inherit my fortune. This will happen only after the child reaches adulthood. As soon as the child turns 18, we will discover his real biological father. This way I won't have to invest money in raising a child. Rest assured Larry will remain in the dark until we reveal the truth on our child's 18th birthday. By then it will be too late for him to react to this. Besides, Larry and I are planning to have more children by then, and he won't have any legal means to stop it. Are you sure your husband still won't know about our relationship? We've been having an affair for three years now, and he doesn't seem to notice anything. He lacks awareness, like an ignorant insect. Moreover, you look so strikingly like him, that any child we have together will look very much like him, which will eliminate any suspicion. We have to be safe, my love. The expression on Sheila's face when she listened to the recording was truly priceless. Then Lilith took out a document on the analysis of fetal DNA and found a lawsuit against Jason West for the payment of alimony for his alleged child. I asked him, who turned out to be a fairly experienced lawyer, for a monthly sum of $3,000. Now, considering that your client rejected the previous offer, I have a new offer. But for this, it is necessary that both parties sign a prenuptial agreement. In this case, the divorce process will be terminated, and the couple will remain married at least until their last child graduates from high school. This is the minimum requirement. If the couple decides to stay married, they will have complete freedom of action. In addition, the terms of the prenuptial agreement will be included in the postnuptial agreement. Firstly, the marriage becomes open to my client. He is allowed to have sexual relations with other women, provided that he warns his wife about it 24 hours before the date. But the wife, on the contrary, is forbidden to have sexual relations with other partners. All children who are born after that will undergo a DNA paternity test. Those children who are my client's biological children will be raised in a family, as should be the case with conscientious parents. Lilith came to a firm conclusion, stating that regardless of whether the pregnancy from another man comes to an end or ends with an abortion, this will lead to the dissolution of the marriage and the deprivation of Sheila's parental and property rights. I noticed how pale Sheila's face was, clearly stunned by the discovery that her affair had been discovered. Lilith then smiled slyly and added, If your client Sheila Dower, formerly known as Sheila Manning, refuses this offer, we are ready to enforce the prenuptial agreement on our part. My client's wife started her affair almost three years before my client got involved in it. Interestingly, it was only after discovering concrete evidence of her infidelity and her intention to conceive a child with another man that my client committed his own act of adultery. If she seeks a divorce, she should know that she may lose her home, financial stability, and release intimate videos of her with another man, not her husband, which may affect her relationships with friends and family. We are fully prepared to take aggressive measures to protect the interests of our client. With her consent, I continued my explanation. I understand that you are hoping to force me to do this, but I can't take responsibility for this act. Instead, I am willing to accept the child into our home as a stepson, provided that your partner assumes financial responsibility. It is very important that he covers expenses related to alimony, health insurance, medical bills, and education. In addition, I expect him to offer our family moral compensation for the harm caused by the attempt to destroy our marriage. I will request an amount of $400,000 for the first time, and then any additional amount that the court determines. Although I have doubts about his willingness to visit the child, if he decides to do so, 
he will be given unrestricted access to the child on mutually agreed terms. Watching my wife's stunned expression, she fell silent. In the future, he will also be responsible for covering the costs of his child's college education. As for me, I am committed to taking care of the child as if he were my own. These are the consequences that you and Jason will bear for your actions. Despite his reluctance to take responsibility for the child, this is exactly what he will have to do. As a result of your betrayal, you will be tasked with raising my children as if they were your own, except for the biological aspect. It is very important that you never make them feel less loved than your own children. In addition, part of our agreement will be that you will be kicked out of the house when you wear jeans. So only those present in this room and Josette know that the children are not your biological relatives. Did you find it funny to watch me raise a child who doesn't biologically belong to me? Well, now you can find humor in raising another woman's children. Do you understand my explanation? Sheila was silent, and her lawyer, glancing aside, replied, Yes, my client agrees. I continued to lay out the conditions. Sheila, how much have you already paid your lawyer? She hasn't paid anything yet. After her divorce and the initial alimony payment, we came to a settlement agreement. I nodded, agreeing with the lawyer's proposal, which stated that Sheila would be obliged to sell all her jewelry and use the proceeds to cover the costs of his services. With Sheila's notarized consent, I will handle the sale process. In addition, we decided to sell her car and settle on a more modest alternative. There was no need for a Porsche Panamera just to run errands for diapers. Lilith nodded her approval, which meant agreement, and I began to draw up the necessary conditions. You will also give Josette a warm welcome when she wants to visit the children in our house. This is your opportunity to redeem yourself despite the hurtful words. I did make the mistake of entering into a relationship with another woman, but it was done in response to the fact that you yourself were already in an affair with another man, which lasted for many years. It is important to recognize the disgusting nature of both of our actions, but you don't seem to understand the gravity of the situation. We must communicate from a position of strength and understanding. I found out about your intentions to conceive a child from someone else and falsely claim that I am his father. Besides, Josette was willing to give birth to my children if she didn't have to raise them alone. That's it, my dear. And now, 18 and a half years later, you're telling me that Aunt Josie is actually my mother, Audrey whispered. What about Uncle Dan? Andy asked. Yes, it turned out that Josette had twins. Audrey was born a minute before Andy. Lenny Sheila's son was born three days earlier. But all three babies were officially registered as Sheila's children. Lilith Shark had a natural talent in such matters, which is not surprising, considering that this is her profession. When we introduced the triplets to our circle of friends and relatives, their surprised looks were numerous. But over time, everyone has come to terms with the fact that this is something unique, but not entirely unusual. Some expressed surprise about the origin of Audrey and Andy's red hair, cursing these annoying recessive genes. But I personally attributed this distinctive feature to the influence of my Irish great-grandmother. But no, my dear son, it wasn't just because of that. Your Uncle Dan joined our family later. Your Aunt Josette got pregnant while unmarried and believed that we, as a married couple, would provide you both with a better life. Being close friends, I decided to adopt you both, because at that time, Josette was not able to raise you alone. It was important for us that your happiness and well-being were a priority, and the appearance of a new father figure in your life would cause unnecessary mental pain. Now that you know the truth, you have to understand one more important thing. Mom and I sincerely love you with all our hearts. Hey kids, guess what? Nothing has changed since we became your parents. We still love you as much as ever. Even though your aunt and uncle have their own family, there will always be a special place for you in their hearts. Now we're all like one big family, isn't that great? So now you have two moms. How do you feel about it, huh?
You are such smart kids and we knew that you would understand everything. We weren't sure if we should tell you or not, but we thought it was important for you to know. Both sides have strong arguments but we decided it was better to share the information with you. We informed Lenny that I was not his biological father, which was a revelation to him. My son never got to meet this despicable man. He had the audacity to challenge the paternity claim, but the undeniable truth lies in the DNA. He tried to downplay the legal costs, but our lawyer wasn't going to let him off the hook that easily. Ignoring the decisions of judges, as a rule, causes their anger. These judges have sheriff's deputies at their disposal, who can visit people at their place of residence or work. He was detained and held in custody until the end of the investigation. After Jason was released from prison 12 days later, he sold his cottage and provided me with compensation in the amount of $350,000 as compensation for emotional damage. The claims of an open marriage turned out to be unfounded. I sought confirmation by contacting Keisha several more times, and my affair with Josette lasted about a year. Sometimes she stayed overnight in our house in my bed, but everything changed when she met Dan. As for Sheila, I'm sure she never showed any indulgences, but I was watching her closely. I used a GPS tracker on her phone and provided her with a personal wristwatch with a GPS SMS tracker. She was constantly monitored, regularly informed about the time spent away from home, and her expenses were carefully monitored. I also used various tactics typical of a possessive husband driven by jealousy. For the first few years, Sheila did not have the opportunity to engage in extramarital affairs, as she was completely absorbed in the responsibilities of raising our three children. She had almost no free time, and she often fell asleep before she even reached the pillow. After the end of my affair with Josette, I firmly decided to remain faithful to my wife. I believed that Sheila had realized the consequences and would refrain from further infidelity. But if I found out that she had lost her way again, I would think about finding solace with Lilith and resuming the cycle. I carefully followed Sheila's actions and did not notice any signs of her involvement in another affair. As soon as Sheila recovered from childbirth, she became very passionate about our intimate encounters. Perhaps she was trying to wear me down to a heart attack. Or perhaps she was trying to convince me that I needed her companionship exclusively. After Larry's 18th birthday, Jason West suddenly disappeared without a trace. Before his disappearance, he took the initiative and created a college fund for his son. Despite our generous offer to let him visit the child, Jason's response was full of rudeness. He unfairly accused me of being responsible for the destruction of his entire life and expressed a desire to sever all ties with us. To be honest, I wasn't particularly worried about his reaction. Rumor has it that this modern Romeo has moved to the East Coast, but according to more reliable rumors, he settled about five miles east of the coast. Naturally, these gossips were known only to a few people. I must admit, I had a meticulous and somewhat vindictive nature when it came to retribution. I couldn't let him shirk his responsibilities of paying child support and college tuition. As for Sheila and me, it's been almost two decades since our little conflict. I conducted a thorough investigation and found no evidence. She really turned into a devoted wife and mother. And good God, she adores Audrey and Andy as much as Lenny does. The depth of her care for the children is truly amazing. It comes from the very depths of her being. The pure affection reflected in her view of these children, who are essentially strangers, is undeniable and cannot be far-fetched. Thinking about my future, I'm thinking about retiring early when the kids grow up and leave home. I have accumulated about a million dollars in my account, and this is a very real option. Someone may condemn me for forgiving an unfaithful wife and accepting children who are not biologically mine. They might argue that I should have taken revenge and destroyed her in the process. But what would I gain from it? Maybe if circumstances had been different, Josette and I would have had a chance to be together. It doesn't matter. The reality is that I wasn't responsible for raising someone else's child. Although I was not his biological father, I prefer to look at it differently. Jason financially supports his upbringing, 
which is beneficial to us. Since Larry is getting a college degree, Jason will have to continue paying child support for another four years. I took this opportunity to provide a good upbringing for the child and not turn him into a problematic person. My wife played a crucial role in raising another woman's children, serving as a constant reminder of my past infidelity. She turned out to be pregnant, knowing full well that her partner would have to take responsibility for their child. At the same time, she was responsible for the maintenance of Josette's children, which sacrificed her self-esteem and her own existence. My relationship with Sheila ensured that our three children would grow up in a caring atmosphere where both parents were present, and this exceeded any other people's judgments about me. As the Papuans of New Guinea wisely say, love may come and go, but the desire for sustenance remains unchanged. I will never be able to understand the motives of people who intentionally cause anger in others. Throughout my life, I have tried not to upset anyone, although it may have been unrealistic to expect the same from others. During my school years, I met Linda, who later became my wife. We became an inseparable couple from the age of 16, and our exclusivity was known to everyone around. After celebrating Linda's 21st birthday, we decided to seal our love and commitment with the bonds of marriage. It was a joyful event. My lifelong friend Alan Hunter was the best man, and Linda's sister Marie and her two nieces became bridesmaids. If anyone had asked, I would have proudly declared Linda's beauty. I was lucky enough to find everything I could wish for in a life partner. Together with my wife Linda, we purchased a beautiful house located on a quiet street in a delightful area. Two years after the wedding, we were happy when Linda became pregnant, and our beloved son Nick came into this world. Eighteen months later, our family was joined by our daughter Gail. Knowing that two children would complement our family, I decided to have a vasectomy after Gail was born. Let me introduce myself. Don Simmons, production manager at a company specializing in the creation of lifting mechanisms and cranes. My chosen profession brings me a stable income, providing a comfortable life for my loved ones. Linda has always endured the role of a stay-at-home mom without a murmur. But after a few years, an unexpected problem arose. Despite the passage of time, Linda remained an incredibly attractive woman. Her figure, breasts, and attractive physique still fascinated me. Unfortunately, it seemed that someone else felt the same way. Although I thought that our life was almost perfect, the children were well-mannered, and we lead a busy social life. But there was one catch. Every month, my parents kindly picked up the children, giving Linda and me the opportunity to spend a date night together. After having dinner and spending a couple of hours at the club, we returned home and indulged in intimate pleasures. This harmonious scheme, which seemed to embody an ideal life, suddenly collapsed on a fateful Wednesday afternoon. After a visit to the dentist, I decided to go home right away, taking advantage of a lull in my work schedule. As soon as I crossed the threshold of the house, a feeling of anxiety seized me, making me freeze in place. Faint sounds coming from above hinted that Linda was either playing a game or the presence of an unknown man. With the utmost caution, I tiptoed upstairs, trying to unravel the truth behind the noise. Realizing that loneliness means there's no reason to miss the opportunity for afternoon intimacy, Linda seems to have come to mind too. Curiosity got the better of me, and I discreetly peeked through the slightly ajar bedroom door to see a shocking sight. My supposed friend Alan Carter was having an intimate act with my wife. Filled with anger and disbelief, I burst into the room, unable to restrain myself any longer. I shouted, fiercely delivering a powerful blow that landed right on Alan's jaw. A cry of pain escaped his lips, and he fell off the bed in agony. Linda, terrified and desperately trying to cover herself, let out a cry of horror. There was confusion in her voice when she asked about my unexpected appearance. What are you doing at home? I replied in disbelief. Don't you remember? I live here. I replied, turning my attention to the unpleasant person. Taking him by the hair, I forcefully pulled him closer and struck many blows. 
Leave my house, you vile man! I exclaimed. Barely holding on to his clothes, I took him to the door and threw him violently on the threshold, after which I rushed back upstairs. Tell me, Linda! I shouted angrily. How long has this been going on? She chickened out and fell silent, refusing to answer my question. I asked the question again, forcing Linda to turn her tear-stained gaze on me. It's been going on for about two months now, she admitted, her voice full of remorse. I never wanted this to happen, Don. It just happened. I nodded, agreeing with her words. All right, take the time to come to your senses and put things in order here before the children return. I'll take a short break and return to our usual time. With a barely perceptible grin, I went down the stairs and out of the house. After parking my car in the nearest parking lot, I went for a walk to think about the situation. Until now, I was sure that Linda loved me back, but I didn't know that she was having a secret affair with my supposedly closest friend. Our home life remained unchanged, leaving no room for suspicion, but I couldn't just forget about this betrayal. Although I was willing to forgive some mistakes, this was not one of them. Instead of immediately turning to Linda, I decided to express my need for solitude and contemplation. That evening, despite her attempts to apologize, I ignored her and fell asleep on the couch. The next day, I decided to contact my workplace and ask for a day off until the end of the week. Fortunately, no one asked about the reasons for my actions. Despite my lawyer's attempts to dissuade me from the divorce, warning me of possible adverse consequences, I stated that this was my personal matter and urged him to start the paperwork process for Linda as soon as possible. After that, I went to the bank, where I took measures to protect most of our savings from Linda's access. From my point of view, she didn't deserve any financial support from me. Back at home, Linda tried to start a conversation, but I quickly raised my hand to stop her. I expressed my indifference to her weak excuse and firmly told her to leave me alone. When Linda left, tears were streaming down her face. In search of solace, I retired to my home office, deliberately closing my eyes from her. When the school day ended, I came early to greet our children, and their joy was obvious. While talking to them, I noticed that Linda was engrossed in a phone conversation. Gail, who was only nine years old, seemed oblivious to what was happening. But Nick, with his keen observation, sensed that something was wrong. Our eyes met, and his expression confirmed his understanding. Catching herself watching Linda, she abruptly broke off the conversation and came over to us, turning her attention to our children. It is always difficult to make a statement like mine, but I chose this moment. I gathered the children and explained to them that my mother and I no longer have feelings for each other but I assured them that I would always be there for them and would spend as much time with them as possible. Linda's face expressed utter shock, and I think if it hadn't been for the children, her reaction would have been screaming. Meanwhile, Nick was silent, staring at the floor. Gail was looking for comfort in my lap, sobbing inconsolably. When I looked at Linda, the expression on my face said it clearly. I thought she was responsible for all this. Linda turned away from me and headed for the kitchen. The sounds of her soft sobs reached my ears. A few hours later, when the children were asleep, Linda plucked up the courage and came up to me. Please, Don, can we discuss this? She begged. Without a moment's hesitation, I waved away her request and retired to my home office. Deciding not to listen to Linda's complaints, I resorted to sleeping in my office chair all night. The next morning, after taking the children to school, Linda informed me that she intended to visit her parents' house. I ignored her plans, preoccupied with finding a new place to call home. Fortunately, there was an apartment a mile or so away. I rented an apartment and returned home to start packing. By the time Linda returned from her parents' house, I had already packed almost all the clothes. So, you're really leaving? What is it? She asked. Yes, I replied firmly. I'm leaving, and nothing you say or do will change my mind. Linda suggested, Would it make a difference if Alan talked to you and apologized? I shook my head saying, No, it won't change. 
Moreover, you can tell that lying snake to stay away from me. If I cross paths with him again, I may well finish what I started the other day. Linda turned away, tears streaming down her face. Ignoring her tears, it was still entirely her responsibility. While I was loading things into the car, a man came up to the house and called Linda. Is this Mrs. Linda Simmons? What is it? He asked. Yes, I'm Linda Simmons, she replied. You have been served, he said, and handing Linda an envelope, he silently left. Please, don't do this to our family, she begged. I didn't do this to our family, Linda. You did it, I said firmly. I got into the car and drove away, leaving Linda in tears at the entrance. I initiated divorce proceedings on the grounds of adultery because Linda was unfaithful. Linda asked me to change the wording to irreconcilable differences. But I resolutely refused because I thought it was important for others to know the truth. In the end, Linda signed the divorce papers, but the process was painfully slow. On the first weekend after the divorce, I invited the children to spend time with me. Nick, my son, asked if I would ever come home. With a heavy heart, I replied, I'm sorry, son, but I'm not coming back, holding back tears. In the following months, the children spent weekends with me every two weeks and several days during the school holidays. In the end, the divorce was finalized, and Linda did not receive any of our savings, although it would seem that the victory was hers. My lawyer warned me about the consequences of such a situation, but he should have clarified that it would affect my financial situation. As a result, half of the mortgage and alimony payments fell on me. Although I didn't mind supporting my children, I resented the fact that I also had to pay spousal alimony to Linda. She was supposed to receive alimony either for five years or until she remarried. Over the weekend, the kids informed me that Alan had moved into the house, and to be honest, it didn't come as a surprise to me. But what really bothered me was the way Linda introduced him to the children, practically telling them to address him as a father. I couldn't ignore it. On Sunday, I took the opportunity to talk to Linda alone. We went out into the garden, away from the children's ears. At that time, Alan was sitting on the terrace, puffing on a cigar. The children mentioned something about being told to address him as dad. Can you confirm if that's true? Linda reluctantly replied, yes. I realized that their father's presence is important to them, and since Alan is here and you are not, they can call him their father. Wait, what do you mean they can? They are my children, and I will not allow them to address this unpleasant man as a father. Alan stood up abruptly seemingly ready to make a scene. Please sit down if you don't want to face the consequences again. Linda stared at me with her arms crossed. I'm serious, Linda. Children should not call this man their father. I'm willing to compromise and ask them to call him Uncle Alan, but no more. When they reach the appropriate age, they will be able to address him by any name they wish. Now that you and this man are living here, I will reduce my mortgage payments by a third, so that he can cover the remaining amount. I walked away, leaving them both speechless. After this conversation, the relationship between Linda and me deteriorated so much that I refrained from visiting the house when I picked up or drove the children on weekends. As a result, my professional life has blossomed. I have more responsibilities and a noticeably increased salary. Fearing that Linda would require additional funds, I decided not to inform her and the children about one issue, but my fears turned out to be unnecessary. During the next meeting with the children, Linda came up to me to talk. After hesitating, I agreed, and we found ourselves in the garden. Don, I think you should know something, she began. Alan proposed to me. Instead of answering, I just shrugged and left with a smile. It seems these people have overlooked the fact that if Linda gets married, my spousal payments will come to an end. On the Monday after their wedding, I canceled the direct transfer. When Linda asked where her money was that month, I answered, You got married, Linda, and that freed me from the obligation to make a monthly payment. I hung up the phone, smiling at the same time. 
No sooner had I hung up the phone, than I heard Linda mutter the word, shit. In a way, I was angry because I was still paying a third of the mortgage, even though I agreed to it so that the children would have a roof over their heads. Thanks to the salary increase and the money I saved by not paying Linda, I got a mortgage and invested the money to buy a house for myself. Despite the fact that the house required a significant amount of work, the children simply adored the new housing. Nick, at the age of 14, perfectly understood the reasons for my divorce from Linda. I think Gail understood this too, although she refrained from discussing it. With the help of the children, I worked hard at gardening. The grass in the backyard grew so tall that I half expected to stumble into the camp of some unknown tribe in its depths. Each child had their own room, and I allowed them to choose colors at their discretion, of course, within reasonable limits. One day Linda came up to me and asked me to look after the children for the upcoming weekend. It seemed that she and Alan needed to be alone. I respectfully declined the offer, as I had my own plans for the weekend. To tell the truth, I didn't have any special plans but I just wasn't inclined to help her. Fortunately, my new neighbors warmly welcomed my presence, and my children quickly became friends with two teenagers living next door. Surprisingly, the only single person on our street turned out to be a widowed woman in her 60s. But I didn't attach importance to communicating with other adults, because my main focus has always been on children. Everything went awry when my neighbor Nicola introduced me to his sister Judy. I was amazed to learn that Judy never tied the knot, especially considering her mesmerizing beauty. At six feet three inches tall, she had an average build and curves that accentuated all the right places. That's exactly how I imagined her to be. As our dates continued, I decided it was time for my children to get to know Judy. Not knowing how Judy was feeling, I assumed she was nervous. But to my delight, they all easily found a common language, and by the end of the evening we easily fit into a typical family picture. Gail had strong feelings for Judy and repeatedly turned to her for advice. It wasn't until a few weeks later, when I was walking them home, that I discovered the hidden reason. Linda and Alan's relationship was strained, it seems, because of the contrast between marriage and casual sexual intercourse. Linda resorted to heavy drinking within the walls of the house, and Alan sought solace in pubs and bars, often absent in the evenings. The situation escalated to the limit when one evening Gail urgently turned to me for help. Linda was heavily intoxicated and in a vulnerable state. Together, Gail and I managed to gently guide Linda upstairs. Gail helped her mother undress and put her to bed, and Alan was absent the whole time. Just when the three of us finally sat down to rest, a sudden knock on the door broke the peaceful atmosphere. Curious, I walked over and found two policemen standing in front of me. Politely inquiring about their purpose, I asked, How can I help you, officers? To my surprise, they informed me that they were looking for Mrs. Carter. Unable to hide my concern, I replied, I'm sorry, but she's upstairs now and fast asleep. It is unlikely that she will wake up today. As her ex-husband, I offered my help. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. After a brief explanation of the purpose of my presence, the children confirmed my story, and the officers broke the heartbreaking news. Last night, Mr. Alan Carter tragically died in a car accident after colliding with a tree. Unfortunately, he did not survive. After assuring the officers, I took it upon myself to inform my ex-wife about this as soon as she wakes up the next morning. Although the children were silent, not a single tear fell when the officers told them the horrifying news about Alan. Nick, glancing at Gail, expressed his concern, admitting that this news would undoubtedly break their mother. In response, she nodded in agreement. I told them to leave for the night, assuring them that we would resolve the issue in the morning. Despite my strong dislike for Alan and his actions, I did not dare to tell Linda about his death. Although I held a grudge against them for their actions, I had no intention of rejoicing in their misfortune. The next morning, Linda stumbled down the stairs, visibly exhausted from a severe hangover. 
Her disheveled appearance was a clear result of excessive alcohol consumption. After looking at me intently, she rudely demanded to explain the reason for my presence. I told him that I arrived last night after Gail asked for help. As you can see I'm safe and sound, you can go now. Linda I suggest you sit down and be quiet, I replied. Linda looked at me reluctantly obeying my request. Okay Don, please explain the purpose of this meeting. I'm not interested in games. There are no games, Linda. Last night when you were intoxicated and asleep, the police came to you. What could they possibly want from me? I have not committed any wrongdoing. I'm sorry, Linda. The police came to inform us about Alan. It was terrible news. Alan had died in a traffic accident the night before. According to our information, he crashed his car into a tree, and it is suspected that he may have been intoxicated. Linda stared at me in shock, which seemed endless to me. Overwhelmed with grief, she buried her face in her hands and tears flowed down her cheeks. Despite the children's attempts to comfort her, it was obvious that their efforts were in vain. I stayed by their side, ready to provide any necessary assistance. But after an hour, I felt the need to apologize and leave. I had deep contempt for Alan because of the role he and Linda played in breaking up our family. But I never wanted him dead. As a sign of respect for him and for the sake of the children's well-being, I decided to attend his funeral. Linda remained silent towards me, but her parents expressed gratitude for my presence and their daughter's support. The only purpose of my presence was to give comfort and help to the children. I learned that Linda took care of all the preparations herself. Seeing the shocked expression on the faces of Linda's parents, they silently turned around and left. While Linda was alone at the grave, I stood next to the children. A month had passed since the funeral, when Nick's urgent phone call interrupted my evening. He begged me to come immediately, as our mother seemed to have lost control of herself. Gail was suffering from her anger, and there was chaos and uncontrollable throwing of objects around. After assuring Nick that I was on my way, I hurriedly headed for the car and raced to our house. At the same time, I contacted the authorities and gave them the disturbing information that Nick had shared. The police assured me that a group of officers were on their way to investigate the situation. I drove up to the house a few moments before the police arrived and hastily parked the car. In my haste, I rushed inside, inadvertently leaving the door ajar. The scene that unfolded in front of me resembled a battlefield. Scattered objects were everywhere, chaos reigned. Linda, being heavily intoxicated, recklessly threw objects in all directions. During her tirade she directed her rage at me, hurling insults with venomous intensity. I managed to dodge the projectiles by carefully making my way to Gail, who was lying unconscious on the floor. As if on cue, two policemen entered the room, who quickly intervened and began to restrain Linda. Despite their efforts, she continued to swear at me, throwing all possible insults in my direction. After that, the man became enraged and attacked the officers, hurling insults in their direction. While officers were escorting Linda to a parked police van, paramedics quickly arrived to give Gail medical attention. Meanwhile, I struck up a conversation with one of the officers, looking back, and saw Nick coming down the stairs, his head wrapped in a blood-soaked towel. Apologizing, he expressed regret and admitted that he had tried to interfere and prevent our mother from harming Gail. In response, she directed her aggression at him, hitting him hard on the head with a blunt object. At that moment he contacted me urgently. I reassured Nick by assuring him that he had done everything in his power to protect Gail. Gail began to regain consciousness, and the paramedic examined Nick's wound. The paramedic noticed, you have a pretty nasty cut, young man. It looks like you're going to have to get stitches. Nick winced slightly when he heard the paramedic's diagnosis. The children went to the hospital for examination, and I assured them that I would join them as soon as I finished talking to the police. When the doctor arrived at the hospital, he informed us that Gail had visibly staggered, but had not received any serious injuries. But Nick had to put stitches on the wound. The doctor advised them both not to strain for a few days. The next day, 
I brought them back to the house so they could pack their things. I told them to pack enough things to last at least a week. Linda's fate remained uncertain, but at that moment I didn't care. As soon as we got back to my house, I told the kids to unpack, and then we could sort out the food issue. The last thing I wanted to do was cook, so ordering a takeaway seemed like the most attractive option. While the children were packing, I settled down with a cup of coffee, but then I was interrupted by a knock on the door. Curious, I opened it. When I drove up to my brother's house, I immediately noticed your car parked at the house. Worried, she asked. My answer was far from comforting. Not really, Judy. You better come in. I sat down in a chair and prepared to listen to the events that had happened earlier. Oh my God, are the kids okay? She asked anxiously. My answer brought some relief. They are upstairs now, cleaning things in their rooms. I said I'd order a takeaway when they were done, but... Interrupting me, she said, No, Don, forget about the takeaway. Go and take care of the children while I do the cooking. If I can't find something, I'll either ask where it is or contact the friendly lady next door to borrow it. We laughed at this joke together. When the children came down the stairs, Gail rushed to Judy to hug her. It was hard for me to hold back tears when I learned that my own daughter feels more confident with a man she met just a few months ago, and not with her own mother. Linda's parents came to her rescue and, unwise, brought her to their home instead of taking her to their place. I found out that Linda has been charged with assaulting children and a policeman. It seems that she managed to break free and hit the officer who was detaining her after the handcuffs were removed from her at the station. One fine morning when Linda left home, I took the initiative to collect the remaining children's belongings. Although I did not formalize custody, I decided not to trust them to her anymore, regardless of the legal consequences. As a result, Linda received a two-year probation period for assault charges. After Linda was advised to seek help for her alcohol addiction, her worried parents decided to offer her shelter. Realizing the severity of her situation, they decided to sell the house, realizing that Linda would not return to it in the near future. After thinking about the possibility of moving in with the children, Linda discovered that they did not want to return to the house that she once believed belonged to her. Therefore, she quickly sold the house, making sure that all expenses were covered sufficiently, and then put the remaining funds in the bank. By law, I was obliged to give Linda her fair share, but there was one condition. First, she had to overcome her alcohol problem. Despite this, life continued for me and the children. Surprisingly, Linda's absence did not affect them in any way. Gail has established an incredibly strong bond with Judy, surpassing anything I've seen before. Meanwhile, Nick found new companions and looked genuinely happy for the first time in many years. I did not actively follow Linda's progress, and her parents did not consider it necessary to inform me about them either. I had no idea that circumstances were on the verge of transformation. The sequence of events began when the children went to bed, and Judy expressed a desire to start a conversation. The disturbing phrase, we need to talk, sounded in my mind. Of course, Judy, what do you want to discuss? I replied, feeling curious. I want to touch on the topic of our relations. When I say we, I mean you, me, and the children, she explained. I just looked at her, confirming her words with a nod. I understand that lately you have been facing various difficulties related to divorce and the fact that you are a part-time father of children. Still, I must admit that I deeply respect your unwavering strength as a person, and this admiration gradually turned into love. Don... I have deep feelings for you, and it's very important for me to understand if you share those feelings. Judy's gaze settled on me, waiting for an answer. The truth is, Judy, I truly love you. Amid the chaos that has engulfed us lately, unfortunately, I have never expressed my emotions. Over the past few months, you have been my rock, and I firmly believe that our successes are interconnected. Therefore, I want you to know that my love for you is sincere, and I sincerely hope that you will not dismiss my words as empty chatter. 
I apologize for not being able to adequately express how much you mean to me against the background of everything that is happening. To tell the truth, I was so caught up in everything that was happening that I didn't find time to express my feelings. Don, I always knew that you loved me, but I longed to hear these words from you. This is one of the few things that seems to have escaped me lately. By the way, did you know that Gail got her period? It took me by surprise, too. She told me about it a few weeks before the incident with Linda. Young girls now seem to be more knowledgeable than I was at her age, but she was worried anyway. One day, she accidentally called me mom without even realizing it. Maybe it's because you've been playing the role of a mother in her life lately. To be honest, I didn't notice any changes or differences. It did not come as a surprise to me when Gail approached Judy about her period. It is unlikely that the girl will feel comfortable discussing such issues with her father. I sat down, smiling warmly at Judy. She looked at me with a puzzled expression on her face. Judy, I began. I want to ask you something, and I will be grateful for your honesty. If I made you a marriage proposal... Judy's face brightened. She sat up, and a smile appeared on her lips. If you had proposed to me, I would have answered with a categorical yes, she replied. But when it comes to children, my answer is an unequivocal no. It's time to be honest with you. I've come to terms with the fact that I cannot conceive a child, and this is a reality that I have known for many years. Maybe that's why I stay single. It seems that as soon as a man finds out about my inability to have children, he quickly finds a reason to end our relationship. Still, I want you to know that I have developed a deep affection for your children and cherish them as my own. Their wonderful character is a testament to your wonderful parenting abilities. Judy and I settled down on the couch, hugging warmly. Our gentle kisses soon led us to the decision to retire upstairs to our bedroom. Before that, we agreed by mutual consent not to tell the children about our conversation. But I tricked Judy into telling me that I wanted to talk to them alone first, even though it was just a little lie. The next day, I left my workplace earlier than usual and headed to the nearest jewelry store. After describing the desired ring to the attentive saleswoman and naming the approximate size, I carefully selected the desired product. Despite this, I decided to keep my usual lifestyle and go home at the usual time, not wanting to give out any hints. Due to traffic problems, I arrived 10 minutes later than usual. Instead of changing my clothes before dinner, I decided to sit down at the table and have dinner without taking off my suit. As soon as we finished eating I stood up, making Judy and the kids assume that I was going to change my clothes. Just as Judy was about to get up and start clearing the table, I suddenly got down on one knee, holding an open box with a ring in front of me. Judy, would you do me the great honor of becoming my wife? Relief finally overwhelmed me when I made my suggestion. Thank God, Dad! I didn't expect you to think about it! My daughter exclaimed. Smiling, Nick said, Judy, will you marry him? Judy, still in a state of shock, looked at the ring and then looked at me. Muttering something unintelligible, she replied, Yes, yes, I will go out. After which tears flowed down her face. Judy got up from her seat and hugged me tightly, pausing a little to wipe her eyes, and then kissed me on the lips. While we were standing there, Gail came over and joined our embrace, causing a new wave of tears. Overcome with emotion, Judy and Gail hugged each other tightly, and Judy asked, does this mean I can call you mom now? They hugged cordially once more. At this time, Nick held out his hand for a firm handshake, followed by a man's hug. At that moment, it dawned on me that none of the children had mentioned their mother and how she would react to our news. Personally, this question did not bother me. From my point of view, it was none of her business. When this story came to an end, the children visited Linda and shared the news about my upcoming remarriage. But she just brushed them off and turned the conversation in another direction. Nick informed me that Linda had sought help for her alcohol problem and seemed to be in a better state compared to their last meeting. By this point, 
I had taken the necessary steps to apply for and obtain legal custody of the children. Although Linda was granted extensive visitation rights, she rarely used them, seeing the children only occasionally, and then at best once a month, for reasons known only to her. After making sure that Linda abstains from alcohol, I wrote her a check covering her share of the sale of the house. Grateful for this gesture, she thanked me briefly, then fell silent. Her father also expressed his gratitude, stressing that he hopes that this money will allow Linda to start a new chapter in her life. After the wedding, Judy and I arranged for the children to visit Linda, but to our disappointment, they returned with the news that she was nowhere to be found, which caused confusion among her parents as well. Judy optimistically suggested that Linda might be starting a new life and eventually get in touch. But unfortunately, this scenario was never realized. In the evening, Linda's father got in touch with the sad news. We got together and he told me that Linda had left and found solace with a man she had met in rehab. Unaware of this, he became involved in the use of illegal substances. Unfortunately, both Linda and this man, James, died from an overdose, as confirmed by the authorities. James began abusing illegal substances again, and Linda also fell into their networks. After Linda's funeral, the children refrained from mentioning her, at least in my presence. Judy took on the role of mother to Gail and Nick. After our marriage, Nick started calling her mom. Watching Judy and the children interact, I couldn't help but think about how Linda negatively affected her own life, eventually succumbing to the effects of illegal substances and tragically ending it. Gentlemen, the following story can serve as a script for some Hollywood movie. It is completely fictional, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. Let's listen to her. Soft snowflakes falling on the trees created a picturesque picture. Although winter in Utah often brings frosts, Salt Lake City was an exception. When the thermometer rarely dropped below minus 5 degrees, snow fell in the city every winter, even if it did not stay for long. When the clock struck 6 o'clock in the evening, a car drove up to the house. To be honest, I wasn't expecting anyone and was hoping to relax a little, be lazy, maybe watch mindless entertainment on TV and drink a beer. When the guests arrived, their car drove slowly along the city side of the valley and parked in the open area behind my house. Taking a quick glance out the kitchen window, I noticed that it was a Chevrolet Silverado, which indicated the arrival of my former father-in-law. Curious, I turned on the coffee maker and headed towards the guest, wondering what he might need from me on this cool winter evening. I wondered if something had happened to Doris. Is she unwell? But to my relief, it turned out that Doris herself was the reason for the unexpected visit. Doris, my ex-wife. Wow, how time flies. It's been six months since we last crossed paths. When I opened the door and looked at Doris, it dawned on me that she was no longer mine. But I must admit that it was nice to see her again. We hugged, and I helped her take off her coat, brushing the snow off it. I couldn't help but wonder why she was here, but don't dwell on it. She just came to visit me and I should appreciate it. And by the way, coffee has never been Doris's favorite drink. To my horror, her teeth had completely discolored. How could this happen again? It's been ages since she last visited me. In any case, Doris, being an orthopedic dentist, probably knew how to properly maintain dental hygiene. I put a glass of orange juice on the living room table and set out plates of croissants and vanilla donuts. She looked around the room, seeming to realize that nothing had changed since her departure. When I took my seat, she settled comfortably in the chair next to the table and watched me closely while I fidgeted. We started a casual conversation, discussing such mundane topics as the weather, my parents' well-being and her own health. But amid the empty chatter, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was some hidden purpose to her visit. It became obvious that she wasn't going to be interested in my well-being. To be honest, after she left, I couldn't help but think that she would take revenge, perhaps even resort to cruelty. But today, if that was her goal, she would have taken my life as soon as I opened the door. She was sitting in front of me, 
Her smile was sincere, and her eyes were fixed on me. There was no trace of aggression in him, nothing at all. I have learned to recognize such signs. Let's cherish this time spent together, enjoying each other's presence. After all, we've been married for almost five years. Our life together was quite fulfilling and I'm not complaining about anything. Of course, we've had our share of ups and downs, but tell me, which family doesn't have them? Our modest home, a charming brick house, has a backyard with outdoor parking. It gives us a break from the scorching summer heat and warms us up during the short winter season. I would get this cabin as part of my work benefits. It was cozy. Two bedrooms located in the attic, a spacious living room and a large basement equipped with a small gym. Despite the small plot of land measuring a quarter of an acre, we did not plan to grow corn. Despite this, the house was very comfortable, and we quickly settled in, even sometimes receiving guests. We really treasured and enjoyed the time we spent in this cabin, as it was a departmental dwelling owned by Brinks. Fortunately, we didn't have to worry about paying the rent, as I had a contract with Brinks. If I had continued to work there for 20 years, the cabin would have become mine as part of my work experience. I would have become the rightful owner of the house without any additional effort. In addition, being a wounded veteran who served in a zone of increased instability, I am obliged to pay half of the utilities, and the rest of the costs are borne by the state. Last year, I improved the house by replacing the soft roof with a durable metal one and giving it a practical and aesthetic dark pale color. The previous roof had an unsightly appearance. This year I intended to plaster and paint the basement in a soothing beige shade, but unfortunately, everything did not turn out as planned. Doris put the glass down on the table in the room. You might be interested to know the reason for my presence here. Dory, why did you do that? I really wanted to meet with you and find out what you want to discuss, but you never came. But I am sincerely glad that you are here now. By the way, I met Noah Foster. I was shocked. Dory, are you serious? He is married and much older than you. Doris was angry. Harris, we just happened to cross paths and started chatting. There is no need to jump to conclusions. He was honest with me about everything. I'm really sorry, Dory. I misunderstood, I admitted, feeling awkward. I thought you were involved in something inappropriate. Dory met my gaze defiantly, and I immediately regretted my rash words. I'm sorry, Dory, I confessed. I said it without thinking. Could you tell me what you discussed with my boss? She leaned back in her chair, and her expression turned sad as it took her a moment to respond. He told me the whole story, she began and explained that you acted out of necessity. It was your duty to eliminate him. There was even an internal investigation. After examining the testimony of passengers and flight attendants, as well as analyzing the video recordings, the commission concluded that weapons were involved in the case. Noah trusted me in every detail, so I decided to forgive you. Despite these words, a bitter smile appeared on my face. Doris was furious, and asked about the source of my amusement. I replied, If you really forgive me, then Noah should have withheld certain information from you. And it all started with an inconspicuous magnetic key. Doris wore a stunning blue keychain around her neck. Intrigued by its beauty, I couldn't help but ask about its meaning. She seemed a little embarrassed and told a story about the supposedly new lock at the entrance to the salt dental wing. However, I quickly realized that this was a fiction, because I had visited the hospital at 1000 North Street just the day before. I intended to spend time with my wife at a local coffee shop, enjoy a pleasant lunch, and discuss my upcoming new assignment. Despite the fact that I will have to be away from home more often, the positive thing was a significant salary increase, almost $25,000. At that time, my annual salary was $72,000, and the Army Disability Pension was $32,000, which equated to about $31,800 in cash. I may have exaggerated a little, but it wasn't such a significant amount. In addition, my family and I now have lifetime health insurance and access to the military commissariat, where the same products are sold as in other stores. 
I also ask you to include gasoline for me and my wife at military gas stations, with a 50% discount. I want to make it clear that I was not a Navy SEAL or a para-paratrooper. During my service in Iraq, I had a modest role as a sniper scout. It was in Najaf that I was wounded by a mortar shell, and I consider myself lucky to have survived. Now I have only a slight limp on my left leg and proudly wear the Congressional Medal of Honor. Does it make a big difference? But no. After being demobilized from the war, I returned home in the 10th year. I was 25 years old at the time. About a month later I was lucky enough to cross paths with Doris Day, a serene and attractive young woman who recently graduated from dental school after graduating from medical school. We met for the first time at an event in support of veterans. Doris chose this profession under the influence of her father, a famous sports doctor. She agreed without hesitation, not wanting to miss anything. On the other hand, I had a chance to get a higher education, but in the end, I went to extreme measures. I graduated from Salt Lake City High School and even went through Sniper Sergeant School in the Army. Despite my questionable choice, we started dating. I couldn't understand why she was interested in me, but she assured me that it was sincere. In August 2000 of the 10th year, Doris, dressed in a beautiful white wedding dress, put an engagement ring on my finger. But when I arrived at the clinic to visit my beloved Doris, she was nowhere to be found. After she left for lunch, her destination remained a mystery to everyone. Surprisingly, the entrance to the wing had no protection. There was not even a simple lock. What should I do in such a situation? How do I get out of it? A direct conversation with my wife about her deception seemed useless to me because I longed for the truth and not another fiction to justify the original lie. Therefore, I preferred to keep a normal appearance, but deep down I began to be tormented by disturbing doubts. I had an epiphany that I found very intriguing. Firstly, our intimate life has been rather sluggish over the past month. Doris was excessively tired at work, constantly suffered from headaches and did not feel any desire. She also struggled with thrush. In addition, we have a new neighbor named Cody Goodman, who claims to be a tall and formidable man who served as a Navy SEAL in the past. This code is what I rented a small house with a garage, conveniently located across the street from us. In an unspecified July, he went to get acquainted with neighbors and unfamiliar surroundings. Among his visits, he also looked into our house, warmly introducing himself on the porch. Despite Dory's kind offer of a cup of coffee, he politely declined and left. Throughout our short conversation, Cody seemed surprisingly calm and balanced, but he developed an unusual habit. He constantly turned the keychain with the keys in his left hand, tugged and stroked it. His carefully concealed excitement and uncertainty became apparent in an instant. At that moment, my eyes caught another magnetic key, painted in a familiar shade of blue. Doubts about infidelity began to torment my mind, fueling a sense of anxiety in me. The situation was unpleasant, even disgusting, but unfortunately I could not take any immediate action to dispel my suspicions. They are firmly rooted in my thoughts not wanting to dissipate. It was clear that something had to be done. As fate would have it, Doris planned to go shopping next Saturday, but suddenly there was a problem with the rear left wheel of her Audi, which led to additional complications. I offered her my GMC for shopping, and she happily agreed. After exchanging keys, Doris drove away, and I quickly sorted out the flat tire and headed to the store. I knew that there was a workshop for making duplicate keys, capable of making copies of various types of keys, including magnetic ones. Having an unfamiliar key in my possession, I wanted to check if it could be copied. When I got home, I wasted no time contacting my wife to tell her about the latest developments. I told her about the details of the agreement and how smoothly everything had gone. Darling, when are you coming? I won't be able to arrive until tonight, Harris. I met Sandra, do you remember her? She asked me to visit her, so I'll see you tonight. Make sure you don't miss me too much. Oh, I wasn't going to be bored. I had a few things to settle. With a new key in my hand, I crossed the street and gently knocked on our new neighbor's door. When there was no response, I knocked with more force. 
but there was still no one at home. Well, it's time to figure out the situation. I carefully inserted the new key into the lock, and to my relief, it rang, clicked, and the door swung open. The world was crumbling before our eyes. Now I was recounting this unusual chapter of my life to Doris. This cunning snake deceived me, and I must have looked completely stupid during this journey. Dear God, Dory, why did you fall for this? You were blinded by love and acted recklessly by starting an affair. This is truly incredible. But we have something else. Let me make some calls, okay? Doris was taken aback, but nodded in agreement. I dialed the chief's personal number. Noah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is it okay if I ask you something? Of course, Harris. What do you want from me? Noah, could you tell me if the Tristan Wright case remains classified or has already been declassified? I'll figure it out for you. Give me some time and I will contact you to get information. We just need to be patient a little more. Dory expressed concern, wondering about the connection with Tristan. Let's stay a minute. After a while, Noah called back. Harris, the case has been declassified. Why did you decide to do this? Doris is present and eager to know the details. We had a previous meeting where we discussed this story, but I refrained from revealing details. I appreciate your help, Noah. You have helped me a lot. I turned my attention to Dory. Well, my dear, are you ready to listen to a sad story? Doris narrowed her eyes skeptically and urged me to share the details. That's what I did. As it turned out, our dear neighbor Cody's name isn't really Cody at all. In fact, his real name is Tristan Wright, and contrary to our assumptions, he has nothing to do with the military or parachutists. Instead, he acts alone, wielding a gun with sinister intentions. Eight years ago, he committed a daring robbery, stealing a truck with money on the way from Phoenix to Kansas City. Inside, the guys managed to hide 450 pounds of worn-out banknotes. The responsibility for transporting this valuable collection fell on Loomis's shoulders, but unfortunately, they made a grave mistake. To ensure maximum safety, the warned money was usually transported in a special compartment of an ordinary aircraft, accompanied by two collectors. Tristan managed to get on board the same plane. Unnoticed, he carried a parachute bag into the cabin. Surprisingly, no one questioned the strangeness of his carry-on luggage. Upon repeated scanning, the metal detector did not detect any suspicious objects hidden in the backpack. During the flight to Missouri, Tristan unexpectedly attacked two armored car collectors, meeting neither provocation nor resistance on their part. His motive was solely to eliminate their interference, as they often found themselves behind his back while he manipulated the pilots. Quickly and effortlessly, he used a plastic knife to disarm them. With the highest skill, he gave instructions to the pilots and made small adjustments to the flight path of the aircraft. He then prepared by putting on a parachute and attaching four garbage bags to special straps. Without delay, he set off on a daring parachute descent over the expanses of the Eagle Bluffs Nature Reserve. As if disappearing into thin air, he managed to escape with an astounding sum of almost three million dollars, leaving no trace behind. Among four and a half thousand acres of ancient forest, its location has remained a mystery. However, he undoubtedly took refuge in a secret hideout hidden in this very wilderness. Perhaps he chose a car, or even preferred to walk. What an unpleasant person. It seems that this unfortunate man must have been pretty tired after eight years. Despite the fact that he enjoyed robbing, he decided to try again, not knowing that federal facial recognition technology now exists. How funny. In addition, he left behind a wonderful robotic portrait with five witnesses. His attention to detail and planning was commendable. It was extremely important for him to find out my travel plans to Missouri, where two federal banks are located in order to manipulate me through you. When he found out that Brinks was transferring money from Salt Lake City, he instructed me to transport bags of money between airports. In order to coordinate the operation, he requested detailed information about my flight, 
including the day and time. Doris sat in disbelief as I continued to explain. I expressed my opinion to him about his actions, wondering why he needed to destroy my marriage because of such insignificant information. I pointed out that he could have obtained it in another way. His response caused confusion. He stated that by receiving information in this way, he made it even more intriguing. Doris sat in agony, her face contorted with pain. A deep sigh escaped her lips, filled with an overwhelming sense of despair. Did he really say that? She interjected, unable to comprehend the situation. I knew that he told you how he was manipulated by the FBI and how the apartment was packed with hidden surveillance devices. They even had the audacity to show me the explicit videos they shot with you. Dory screamed, her voice filled with anguish. Oh my God! They witnessed everything! My God! My God! My God! She repeated, her suffering growing. Suddenly she jumped to her feet, her eyes full of accusation. You knew all along that Cody was cheating on me and yet you didn't do anything, how could you? I begged Dory, hoping desperately that she would understand me. Dory, please listen to me. After finding out the owner of the key that you possess, they called me in the evening and called me to the chief's office. When I entered, three FBI agents were waiting for me, ready to interrogate me. They doubted my presence at the intruder's door, and although I gave an explanation, they remained skeptical. But in the end, after persistent persuasion, I convinced them of my innocence in the robbery. It was during this conversation that they revealed the truth to me. Looking at Day with a feeling of compassion, I realized that by that time everything had already fallen apart. Our marriage has irreparably collapsed, turning you into a simple stranger. I was told to keep some details secret, stay calm and postpone the divorce, and I did it all. At my request, I was shown a series of explicit videos featuring you and Cody. Dory, despite his promises to marry you and accompany you to the Philippines, everything he said was a hoax. Every word that came out of his mouth was an invention. It was about a significant amount of money, possibly millions, and he was willing to go to extreme lengths, even to the point of death, to achieve it. So you can consider yourself lucky to be relatively unscathed. As an uninvited witness, he was capable of ruthlessly ending your life. Therefore, we took off from the international airport at four o'clock sharp, with the intention of reaching Port Wheeler by half past five. As soon as he got up from his seat in the cabin, the whole group felt that something ominous had begun. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I also stood up to intervene. During the transportation of valuables, access to the rear of the aircraft was strictly prohibited, as was once again stated in the announcement. Stopping in front of me, Tristan took out a plastic knife and tried to point it in my direction, intending to cause harm. He did not know that a secret group of FBI agents was hiding in the hut. A formidable squad consisting of eight experienced people accompanied by their trained wolfhounds. A sudden shot pierced his shoulder, and that's an understatement to describe the excruciating pain caused by the high-strength bullets that shattered the joint. It is noteworthy that I did not take part in this brutal fight. Doris, unable to watch his suffering, covered her face with her hands in agony. No matter what, her affection for the old man remained unshakable, and it was difficult for her to understand what he had been through. As soon as the scene unfolded, he was quickly handcuffed and immediately given medical attention. By asking permission to sit next to him and talk, I got the opportunity. Then he informed me that he had entered into an intimate relationship with you solely for the sake of entertainment. In addition, he stated that he had no intention of harming me. He suggested that both of us, as people with military backgrounds, could resolve our differences peacefully. It is a pity, he remarked, that our conversation was suddenly interrupted. I grinned, acknowledging our military qualities. He tried to make a deal with me by having an intimate relationship with my wife. Unbeknownst to him, he had never served in the army, the scoundrel. Harris, you're telling a truly disturbing story, Doris said in a trembling voice. It feels like I'm trapped in an alternate reality. I never imagined that things could get to this point. 
It is unacceptable to treat a man or a woman in this way. I must admit, I had strong feelings for him. Please share with me the details of his death. Daria, it's incredibly hard for me. I just want to know that he is no longer alive. Oh my God, what am I saying? Harris, you've really upset me. Okay, let me calm down. She took a deep breath, trying to regain her composure. Please talk to me. I'm here and I'm ready to listen. I fulfilled his request. He asked me to go to the bathroom and I invited him to go with him. After all, where else could he have gone from the plane? Harrison settled down on the toilet and I quietly put my spare Browning revolver on his lap. This was our last dispute and I acquired the firearm by accident, unregistered and untraceable. I usually carried it in a secure holster on my shin, but that day I hid it behind the cuff of my sock. After giving Dory a stern look, I asked a question. Dory, do you understand that I'm confessing to you about my misdeeds? And if you decide to report me to the authorities, I will retract every word, presenting everything as your invention. Dory wiped away her tears, her voice trembling. Harrison, I solemnly swear on my life and my mother's welfare that I will never harm you. Dora suddenly stood up and hurried towards me, holding out her hands. Harry, Harry, my dear Harry, she exclaimed, but I pulled away, rejecting her embrace. Stop it, Dor. I'm not expensive, I'm stupid. I forgot about you, not knowing how much pain you're in. But listen, my love, it's all in the past. Don't worry so much. It's actually better that it happened now. We are young, we have no children, and we are still able to find our soulmate in this huge world. We sat in silence. I froze on the countertop separating us, lost in thought. Memories of the time when I shared the fateful news with my beloved wife surfaced in my memory. It was after a late night flight, and the alarm clock in our bedroom showed a clear time of 2.14, imprinting this moment in my memory. Deciding to share the news, I gently woke my wife from her nap. Doris, please wake up. We really need to talk, I said. She moaned in response, doubting my sanity. Harry, are you out of your mind? I'm already asleep and I have to get up early tomorrow morning. I continued to insist on my own, assuring her that waiting was not an option. Yawning and scratching, she reluctantly went to the bathroom and then returned and sat next to me on the bed. Dear, what is the urgent matter you wanted to discuss with me? Doris, I know about your relationship with Cody. Despite this, Doris remained unperturbed. She let out a deep, sorrowful sigh and said, It looks like you would have found out the truth sooner or later. Harry, I've decided to end our marriage. I have feelings for someone else and I'm really sorry, but I'm leaving you. No, Doris, you can't go to him because I ended his life, I confessed. How? The wife gasped, clutching her chest, when her husband told her that he had shot at the code, leaving him with three wounds. Dora's loss of consciousness took me by surprise, and I froze, not knowing what to do. But after making sure that my wife was still breathing and my pulse was stable, I convinced myself that it wasn't that important. In search of solace, I retired to the second bedroom and locked myself in, not bothering to undress or make the bed. Exhaustion overwhelmed me, and I fell into a deep sleep. The next morning I woke up much later than usual, around 10 o'clock. To my surprise, Doris had already left. It looks like she packed all her things, and I assumed she went to her parents before heading to work. Towards the evening of the next day, I finished the work on a fair division of our common finances. Our salaries were almost the same, with a slight advantage in my direction. Therefore, it was fair and just to divide everything equally. A few days passed, and her parents, Jacques and Misty Day, came to visit. They were wonderful people, and I didn't want to bother them. I set the table with a bottle of red wine, some delicious treats, and a jug of apricot juice. In general, I tried to be as hospitable as possible. In the end, the decisive moment came. Jacques stepped forward and spoke. Harris, our daughter has informed us that she has decided to break up with you. Misty said that her daughter couldn't live with me, that she hated me. But she doesn't want to tell him what happened. No, Mom, she's not coming back to me. The lawyer is already busy preparing the divorce agreement. Misty sighed and waved her arms. 
My God, what happened to you all? I accidentally ruined her lover and she's in a lot of pain. Let's not let her lose hope. Jacques is deeply concerned. Harris, why did you decide to do such a thing? You could go to jail for that. No, Jacques, they can't. Everything was done unnoticed. And the father-in-law and mother-in-law were left completely perplexed. Dory, you don't need to lose your temper. Just move on with your life. Find a decent man, settle down, start a family, climb the corporate ladder. It's simple. But then, unexpectedly, she discovered her true feelings. Harris, let's start all over again, she suggested. I was stunned. What do you mean? I asked. Let's start dating, become friends, she interjected. Dory, we're not even enemies right now, I replied. No, instead we should establish a friends with benefits relationship. Do you understand that? Perhaps in the future we will have a desire to get married again. I'm sorry, Dora, but I'm not ready to remarry, so the answer is no. Please wait, Harry, take your time. Remember, we had a good relationship. Give yourself time to think about it. I've been thinking about it a lot, my dear. Now you should think about it too. Why do you need a husband you don't love and who will constantly betray you? Dora froze in shock. Why? She asked, wanting to clarify the situation. Why did you decide that you would be an unloved husband? I just shrugged, deciding not to go into the discussion of my emotions. It wasn't about her. It was a personal thought that came to my mind. And why do you think that I will betray you endlessly? Do you want me to hurt you the same way I hurt myself? I quickly objected. No, I have no desire to hurt you intentionally. If I had changed, it would most likely have been caused by a lack of commitment to our relationship. After a short pause, silence fell over us, and then Doris got to her feet, signaling for departure. Come with me, my love, she beckoned. Putting on her coat, she hugged me tenderly, saying goodbye. I will consider your words and try to muster the courage to accept your betrayal, she muttered. Besides, I will try to find a way back to your heart. With that, she left. But I decided not to reveal to her my intimate relationship with a widowed neighbor. After all, Doris should know about her questionable actions, right? In addition, Ruby burdened with the responsibilities of raising two children and in a difficult financial situation, is now fighting an uphill battle for a better future for her sons. If I haven't decided to marry her yet, I won't leave her to her fate. I have a lot of things I want to do for her. I'll tell you that Ruby is ten times better than my ex-wife in the bedroom. She's indescribable, you know what I mean? So let Doris speculate as much as she wants, but it won't affect our relationship in any way, 